Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to occur to oneself when one embarks on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and a teaching artist, and the other host is... Hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I make games. I design user experiences, and I coach about all that. So how are you doing, Jersey? Um, okay. I'm, you know, suffering from a little bit of a cold, uh, mm-hmm. a post, post-convention post cold. We were both hanging out last weekend at uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus in Columbus, Ohio. <clears throat> it was a good time. Got to play some pinball together, play some video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and see a lot of inspiring comic art, both present and current, and, uh, you know, stretching throughout a... <laughs> pretty big chunk of uh history in my opinion typically if i'm like oh yeah i'm gonna look at some old comics i may think oh there's a long box at the local retailer gonna see you know what's a good deal but like this is you know i got to see comics that were dating back to what the 1800s a whole bunch of examples but then multiple things from the 1700s as well i believe anyway that was Wild. One might wonder, were these on display at the convention? No. Rob got a private tour of the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, uh, led by my wife Anne, who works there as the museum coordinator now. Um, now yeah, that was it was fun watching you go on the tour and getting to see the collection through fresh eyes again. Because I've been I've been on that tour like a lot of times. Not not to say I'm jaded. Like I'm still like breathless when i'm in there but it's cool to see that initial shock like when you turn she took you to this other table she took the, the cover off the table and it's like uh five frames from the gertie the dinosaur cartoon by winsor mckay and you did the, this jump back you're like is that gertie <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> yeah I, I mean it just kept happening during that that tour there's so uh it's yeah it, it's um it was a lot to absorb and it was just, it, um, it's, I don't know what it is. It's like, okay, it's information. It's sitting there and there's something about it when it's physical and in front of you, um, you know, watching a, a YouTube special that talks about the history of animation or, or you see something, someone write a great article about, uh, you know, about comics or read, you know, uh, read understanding comics by Scott McCloud or whatever, but then to see these, actual works that were touched by the hands of the artists um, laying on a table in front of you or even or hung up in, in the museum or whatnot. Uh, it's, it's affecting, it, it affects me. So like I felt, so maybe you're, you're sort of, um, you've been adjacent to it for long enough. You're like a character in Dragon Ball Z who's seen a Kamehameha wave, right? But for me, I'm like, oh, such power, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, the fr- I'm fresh surprise guy. <laughs> no, it, is, it that's that's the effect it has on people. And you know, it's like I I really and I I've said this to Ann since, and I should say it every day. Uh, I have to offer a huge apology because I remember the first time this would be like in 2006 when I my work was, was uh, somebody asked to have my work on display in an exhibition in a gallery on a college campus, and I remember being like. What are, you, what are you doing? Why, why would you take the comics art out of the context of the book? The book is the thing you make, not the pages that go into the book. The art That is like an incidental, like I- incremental piece of the thing that you're making. But you take it out of the context and you're breaking the whole thing. So why would you do that? You know, and then like, uh, even when the stuff was on display, I was kind of like cross my arms going, Harumph, I don't know. I don't know about this. This is weird. I don't really feel like this is the real thing. This is real art the way you guys are thinking about it. And then you go and you see like the stuff at the Billy Ireland where you see like real masterworks like Bill Watterson, you know, like Jack Kirby, like Windsor McKay, you know, on display there. And, you, and like you said, this is the, you see the, 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 the artist's hand on the page. You see the whiteout, you see the erase marks, you see the pencil marks. And it takes on a whole new kind of meaning. And I, and like, I remember after like one of the first times we went, which was probably like 2014, I think is when we went on our first tour. And I turned in, I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. I was, I was a, I was a butthead. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it now. It's pretty great. Uh, so it's well, I don't know. So it it's easy to get locked into locked into assumptions. I don't know. It's and when you're passionate about something, easier to have blinders, what have you. Uh, yeah. 
but you know, being kind to past Jersey, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know, past Jersey. Uh, well, I'm glad, you know, glad he came around because yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing to see that the, the subtle shake in the line art uh, of, of, the, of Charles Schultz and yeah. The, yeah. I mean, so many details. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's worth it. It's you know, when you create your art, um, it's a good idea to, to, you know, keep track of it and understand the stories about it and all that stuff. Maybe journal about it. Cause if, if, um, cause when, if, when it ends up in, in that kind of museum context, you're going to have someone reacting to your work someday going such power. And that's, um, you know, it'll be worth it. Oh, that's good. Uh, so <coughs> another thing that happened at uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus this weekend, this past weekend, was um, I led a couple of workshops um, and and a comics game show. But uh, the, the things that, that, that pertain to the topic this week are I did a demonstration on how I draw comics in Clip Studio Paint. And... Uh, I also did a workshop on science comics rockets for kids on, on Saturday. Uh, and it got me thinking about how when I was doing these different workshops for different constituencies, because the clip studio paint workshop was for working artists. It was a talk and teach, which is like a professional develop, development track they do at CXC. And then the workshop I did about rockets was really aimed at like 11 to 12 year olds. And it, the type of stuff that I brought to those two different events were very different. And it made me wonder, uh, maybe we could talk this week about like how we think about the teaching part, both in terms of like how we unpack what we do and then how we think about it as a service. And then I also realized, as I was thinking about this topic, that Rob, guess what? Uh, you've got a new workshop out, like, because this is October. We're in the midst of creative challenge season. And... You just happen to drop this workshop, customizing your next creative challenge, which is on Skillshare and on Gumroad, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, very fresh and top of mind. I've created a few workshops this year, actually. And that's typical for any given year. I end up creating a handful, like maybe one to three or so workshops or updating existing ones and stuff. But like, yeah, this year I, I, I put out... Um, the let's see drawing user journey maps to design user experiences gather ideas and collaborate and then i put out um, seeing and drawing happy characters like the happiest kitty in the universe and then just recently totally not an accident right before the creative challenge season i did drop uh customizing your next creative challenge and uh, there's um there's there's kind of there's, there's especially in those three workshops i have some uh it's like a current fresh approach and ways I was thinking about them because it's all from this year. And mm. uh, yeah. So it'd be yeah. fun to talk about, you know, what, how do we think about it? How do we structure them? The structure of the current ones and, and maybe, you know, what that means. Yep. Agreed. All right. Well, with that, then how about I hit some music so that we can uh, make signal to everybody that we're about to head into the proper <laughs> beginning of the show. Such power. Such power! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, be doing a little bit of that today. Uh, so let's talk about, like, where, where do we want to start? Like, um, what do our workshops look like? Uh, breaking it down to... Um, I wonder if it might be useful to, like, very quickly frame up, the di like, the difference between, between a workshop description and a procedure, right? Um, when we do... Uh, workshops, proposal submissions for the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival every year. I ask the proposing uh, artist to give us a description, which is a blurb, sort of enticing you. So like, uh, uh, in this hands-on workshop, you'll learn the secrets of shapes and how shapes relate to how uh, they make us feel in character design and how shapes can be used for a variety of sound and design elements in comic storytelling, something along long, long line. It doesn't mm -hmm. describe exactly what you're going to do, but it gives you the gist of what kinds of uh, subject matter you're going to be uh, handling and whether or not it's going to be a presentation or a hands-on workshop or is there going to be some kind of drawing in there? What's the objective of the thing? And the procedure is usually like what happens in there? Like this is the thing you describe to the to the hosting organization or facilitator to say like uh, here are the activities in the order that we're going to do them in order to produce X, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And even the title. I mean, that that package of the the title and the description is is very helpful in my opinion. And in a way, it's it's a really cheap and quick practice where you can just make a bunch up, make up a bunch of titles, play around with the descriptions, and then you 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 can figure out like, oh yeah, that this sounds both interesting and fun and like something I have, I, I, I've got something to say about this. I can share and unpack and then you can dig into your procedure about that. This is how you're sharing and unpacking and, uh, and providing others the, the chance to, to, you know, learn something under that umbrella. Um, so like I typically play around with those first two things before digging too far into the procedure. But even then it's all outline based at first, right? So you can, you can do a lot of playing just at that level before you develop your the, the details of sort of um, tighter talking points, examples, all that stuff. So it's um, it's a nice, I, I find it nice to, in that approach. So when you are presenting or, or desiring to present at an event or were asked to submit something to an event, you can just do some playing around and, and do some creative work there to try to you know, pitch stuff and see what sticks without having to go too far and, and developing it. Cause maybe, you know, one of them gets, gets approved and others don't. So, you know, you can show like, Hey, I've got a variety of things without have, having to have invested too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's sort of like a uh, first draft. Yeah. We, mm-hmm. we talk about this a lot. First draft sloppy copy. This is like your, uh, the reason we sketch and use loose lines in our first draft is so that we don't invest too much time or energy into it. And we're like throwing out all the wrong lines to find the right lines and so on. So, yeah. Um, so you want to, who do you, you want to start first with walking through the structure of one of our workshops and I'll do one of mine and then. Okay. Happy to. Um, well, I, like, we can start with, uh, the recent one, customizing your next creative challenge. I figured that would and, be like top of mind. Yeah. Let's, you just yeah. finished this. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I what I have here is is sort of um like a a whole um it's an online packaged workshop. It's not facilitated or um it's it's time shifted, right? So the facilitation is baked in. You consume it at whatever pace you want, whenever you want. And if you want to interact, you do that whenever you want. And then I'll notice when folks interact with it and and uh, comment on a you know, also time shifted uh, manner. So anyway, that whole packaging means that encountering this workshop, it re- it's really important to almost like you, you talked about the, the having the workshop description. The first m- exposure to these Skillshare and these online workshops, I've been making that a very deliberately like a mini pitch and sort of sample of like what what you would learn, right? And here's, it's almost a little bit of what I might cover in the first, first few minutes of, of a regular workshop, but it's a little more pitch amped up, right? And that's, that's true for those, the, the, both, all three workshops I worked on this year. So um, the introduction to customizing your, your next creative challenge is meant to connect to different motivations to why you would potentially get into this, right? It's, I didn't make this like customizing your next um, stamp design creative challenge or customizing your next mini comic or anything because I've participated in a variety of creative challenges and observed plenty over the years. So I thought this is a recipe thing. This is a, uh, like a design procedure thing. So it's, it's meant to reach out to those different audiences that would be engaging in a, you know, a time-based creative activity. And, and that introduction is this whole con- context setting thing that that ho- hopefully helps you choose like oh yeah i get this this relates to me or it doesn't and then from there you you jump in hopefully um energized and curious so as i look at the chapters or lessons there's introduction then there's chapter 2 finding your fun chapter 3 where to play chapter 4 your rules Chapter five, project. Chapter six, tips and wrap up. And chapter seven, bonus examples of my past creative challenges. Uh, <clears throat> can you ex- describe to me what each of these are and why you chose to chunk it out that way? 
Right. So they all have a job and that's, that's where, um, depending on the workshop, you're going to break down the big problem into smaller stages and hopefully have ways to integrate those stages, um, along the way. And that's, so that's true for all, pretty much all my workshops, but this one, um, it's based on this premise of, well, a creative challenge. Well, it is hopefully an interesting experience that it, that, that you find engaging. And when you think about the kinds of fun you like to have, you can sort of fine tune the style of your creative challenge to really uh, fit into that. You might do it incidentally, but this is a workshop to help you really do it on purpose, being very intentional about setting up, um, well, what, and, and well, first discovering and then using that discovery to, to go into a plan for how you how you would go about your creative challenge, which is all covered in the introduction. And then now you're, you're digging in by looking at what's fun to you. And, and there's a, there's an exercise in, in there and some reflection to help you start to gather that. Like you're doing a, a self interview of sorts. Okay. So in, in the case of this one, you're not saying you're not going to present them with what are you going to do A, B or C? You're asking the, the participant to say, well, what do you find fun? Let's, let's, here's a creative, an exercise to help you generate some data as to what you find pleasurable in art. Let's, 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 let's let's identify what you find pleasurable about making art. And actually it's more about games. (laughs) Oh, okay. So it's, it's using, um, this exercise of, of essentially a, uh, a quadrant of going, uh, from, uh, let's see not in, let's see in, not interesting to very interesting and not, um let's see uh what was it difficulty um low difficulty to high difficulty so thinking about something that's in that upper right quadrant that would be very engaging something that's in the lower left quadrant super tuned out and it could be different reasons why you would you do that so if you unpack a few different games and fit them into these different quadrants you can think about well what is it about them what what do i find fun so instead of being admired in the specific specifics of exactly you can throw in art activities or and, and or any kind of game or activity that you can think of that you find you could easily put toward you know uh interesting or not interesting to inter- interesting and uh, um, uh, difficult or not difficult to, to very difficult or what have you. Um, anyway, so that that's just a rough draft, quick explanation uh, of, as far as the, the exercise. But then out of that, now you have some, some examples that are just safe to explore outside your art. Maybe jumping straight into examining your art. It's um, yeah, we take a, we take a side path to get there which is hopefully faster because we're not caught up into all the specifics of, of the art yet because you go from finding to your fun to starting to incorporate some of the aspects of your art in the where to play. So where to play as far as what kind of challenges you're interested in, what kind of circumstance do you want as far as collaborators or not socializing or not. And that's, you know, more of that, that can define sort of where you might focus on, on, taking part in a creative challenge and then the rules is sort of the the refinement and the um arranging toward getting to the outcomes that you want to get to it's like oh i want to make a product i just want to practice i just uh, that kind of thing and so you combine all that stuff and now there's a project the the you you've been doing reflecting you've you've been exploring through easy approachable exercises and then you've got essentially ingredients laid out before you, you can assemble into your own recipe and then test it out. And that's what the project is. So you create a mini challenge based on what you think would be fun and you see how it went, what went well, what didn't. And now you've got uh, potentially an approach that is either close to where you want to go or exactly where you want to go. And now you're, you're set up. And then the tips and wrap up is that's a format that I've, I, I've been enjoying that I started doing in the, um, the drawing user journey maps in that I like to cover when you're designing something and, and, and working on a project, what could go wrong or what are some things to like look out for? What are some things to really tune into? So just a couple extra um, reinforcement tidbits plus celebrate all the work you've done so far. And then you know, typically that's where um, one of my workshops would end. But then instead of just leaving this one here, 
I, I actually re- uh, created one more section that gave extra context because it's like, well, all right. So you talked about this general thing and you know, there, sure there was a, some tidbits and specifics here and there because I work through the, the examples as I go. It's not that I, you know, I say, now pause the video while I stare at you and you fill out a form. Um, it, and um, so I'm, why not provide some, some, let's see, extra c- signal toward, yeah, I've done a plenty of, I've, I have worked on plenty of creative challenges before. And uh, it might be interesting to briefly cover some of that and tell that story and uh, show some visual examples and stuff so people can have a idea of just, you know, maybe you're brand new to creative challenges and have no, no idea what, what to expect. Context or maybe setting, yeah. About being too precious. And you can see, like, I created lots of, like, quick, sketchy stuff. And that's, that's part of the practice. Anyway, so that's just extra context and almost like um, a brief, you know, mini story time. Mm. So what, I'll tell you what I'm not hearing in this. I'm not hearing uh, urgency. I'm not hearing uh, like uh, some kind of call to being part of a movement. I'm hearing. I'm hearing that this this sounds like something you've crafted specifically to focus on maximizing benefit to the individual who's actually doing the thing as they define benefit, right? Yeah. Rather than so. It's honestly, it's a little silly how reusable it is because uh, that approach you could literally use for planning any activity with yourself or with a class or whatever. I, that's, I, ma- I made a recipe that, yeah, it totally applies to creating your next creative challenge. But why are you using your next, next creative challenge? Are you going to go present an activity to a class? Are you going to participate in making something for 10 days in a row? All right, either way, it works. Is a project a creative challenge? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I don't, I don't go there, but... Except, yeah. except, except here in this commentary. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's like, it's, it's, but it, by swinging back the camera back around and pointing it at the person who's actually doing the challenge and asking, well, why are you doing it? Uh, I think it, it drops a drapery over the whole bewildering light uh, array of doing a creative challenge with other people, right? Like, so like I, I just ran a 5K, uh, you know, f- my first 5K with my wife, Anne, and there's something about doing something with 2,000 other people, right? There's something about doing that in that, like, it, it raises the spirits or it can crush the spirits depending on like how you're interpreting it, right? Like there's people who are really clearly, they, they want to do their personal best. They want to, they want to place in the rankings. And there's people who are just there for the fun of it. There's people there because, you know, I, I'm not in their heads. I don't know everybody's motivations, but I can tell you that my energy was different being amongst that many people than if I was doing it alone. And, you know, the creative challenge season, there's an aspect to it where there's this whole social element, but what I'm what I'm hearing about your workshop is saying like, yep, that's there, but let's not look at that just for a second. Let's look at what you want first, and then we can figure out how that fits into these other places. Absolutely, this uh, this whole approach is is inclusive of uh, working working solo with no socializing. <laughs> that's absolutely valid, and part of it's 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 part of the options you have to when you craft something for yourself, and hopefully. Because hopefully you aren't you're not setting your, yourself up for a um, for like some kind of no win, be, you know, without really just just taking this this workshop is um, if you watch every minute of it it's 27 minutes if you do the activities it could, that could take you 10 minutes to an hour right so you take an hour and a half at max and hopefully you're not jumping into some kind of um, mismatch of like i didn't want to do this publicly or in this way or with these people or with this hashtag or what so yeah just get set up to to do the thing that feels like a good fit for you and learn from it yeah i i i just i wanted to say that out loud to dog ear it so that in the second half we can talk about like how you arrived at servicing that person right well, well, yeah cool it, yeah I, I, yeah, because like it, this is this is something I was thinking about with mine. Uh, I guess the example I can dig into with mine <clears throat> was uh, 
the Clip Studio Paint workshop that uh, I or presentation slash demo that I did at the Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. And I remember it, it. the topic came fairly quickly and sort of urgently. It was just sort of like, hey, if you did a, a talk and teach, what would you do? And I was like, well, I guess I could do something about Clip Studio Paint. But then the next question became, well, why would I do that and not some other topic? Why would I choose that instead of something else that I do? Um, and then I th got to thinking about how, like, well, I know that more people are using Clip Studio Paint than before, but there's still people I talk to who say to me, oh, but dude, I am in the Adobe ecosystem. That I've been there since 1995. I, I'm comfortable there. Uh, you know, I, I, I would love to use Clip Studio Paint, but I don't have the time to learn a whole new interface. And I was like, ah, well... That's, that's the user that I can help, right? That's the person who is curious about it. They've heard about the affordances, but they're, they're really worried about the learning curve. And so that helped define how I structure the thing where it's like the first third of my presentation was all about like, let's look how this is exactly like Photoshop. There's our paint bucket tool. We all know what the paint bucket tool does. Here's the brush tool. We all know what the brush tool does. Layer palette. Hey, look at the layer palette. Hey, we can lock transparent pixels here. We can lock the layer there. We can move layers around. Layer modes, they're right there. Just where we, where we always uh, expect them to be, you know? And like, it's all of the, like, there's like, you know, a full 15 to 20 minutes of like comfort building, right? Uh, Look, it's not a big scary thing. Now let's look at some of the weird stuff it does. Whoa, what's this? You know, like, oh, it's the operator tool. What does that ma manage? Well, we can manage all these different kinds of vector tools. What? There's vector tools and raster tools inside of it. Yeah, let's dig a little deeper, you know. Um, so think about the person I'm trying to help and what I've heard them say and heard them report as being the chief difficulty helped create a path for me to deliver the information and present it in a way that was... Uh, uh, doled out in such a way that I'm not overwhelming or bewildering people. And then an advantage I had over what you're describing with your Skillshare class is I was able to t stop for a second and say like, okay, before I go any further, I have lots of things we can talk about, but I'm curious, what's a problem somebody in this room is trying to solve right now? What's one thing you've messed with in Clip Studio Paint that you were like, what the hell? I don't, I don't get it. You know, and then hands went up, right? And I was like, this guy's like, oh, I, I don't understand the lettering tools. I'm like, cool, let's go there right now. Let's just talk about lettering tools now that we understand the interface, right? So, uh, so I see when people are first starting to teach that, and I, and I know I've said this before, but people sometimes think that they have to show up as an expert with the full structure of how the information is going to be delivered locked in stone and everybody shut up, not shut up, but everybody just like pay attention while I deliver this information. And then I'll see them get frustrated because nobody's interacting with them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they'll be like, well, is, is this landing? Is anybody getting anything out of this? Come on. Like, well, what are you expecting? Because you're controlling the conversation. And so like another part of it is, is like this, this perspective taking and this thinking about like, maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves talking about the second half of the show. We can take a break in a minute and get to that. But um, this idea of, this structure we have being really defined by helping a specific person's problems, whether it is uh, a persona that we do perspective taking on or real people that we interview and discuss this stuff with. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And, and I, that's, uh, it sounds like you really structured this, this workshop initially with this. Um, that's one of the wonderful things about performing a live workshop is having, like a, a few seeds that you can plant and then see where things naturally want to grow next. Yeah. And I love that about live workshops, but, but you, you had those initial, initial seeds and, and like, so how much of your outline was pre-planned versus when it went more uh, focused on that specific audience you were so, sure. so first of all, my outline was on sticky notes, uh, and it, you can think of it as, as this: the, the it was linear in structure only for the first twenty minutes. The first twenty minutes was establish how, the similarities between CSP and Photoshop. Right, that's the first twenty minutes. Then the remaining forty minutes was a branching sort of mind map of all of the different nodes of cool stuff CSP can do, 
And based on what... It, it, so the lettering tools, that was on there. I had every intention of getting to it. But by polling the room, I got to it first so I could address something that... So I made sure there was time to address something that somebody in the room was absolutely interested in. Now, if I did this as a Skillshare workshop, I would probably do all those nodes as each like a three-minute thing, right? Um mm -hmm. And it would just be like, I would label them appropriately so you could just go to the one you want. So either way, it would do the same job, but like I was able to uh, sort of do it on the fly in that moment. And the nice thing was I was able to like look the guy in the eye and go like, did that make sense to you, right? But um, but yes, it was not struck. I, did, I don't, I never walk into a workshop anymore with a sense of like, this is the structure outside of, this would be a little bit of risk diminishment at the top, I'm going to talk about like, you know, walk them through the activity we're going to do. And then we'll see where we go after that. Like, cause I've got all these nodes sort of like pack, packed up in my bag, ready to pull out at any given time. But that's from 10 years of teaching, doing this stuff that I know how to do that now. But um, I keep going back to what my, my own Jedi master told me when I was first learning teaching is when I showed her my lesson plan. And she said, this is great. You know, you're not sticking to it, right? You know, it's like, I think about that all the time. And I think about how scary that was to me in the moment when she said that. And I also think about how liberating that was. She she freed me from feeling beholden to uh, a procedure. Mm. That uh, yeah, that that's so awesome. I uh, I share I, I share a similar journey. I didn't have that Jedi Masters per se, but uh, but it's but have learned from many a wide community of so many awesome examples, including you, Jersey. So mm. it's been, um, uh, it is, yeah, that that's, it is liberating. So, but some, but you did, that's interesting. So in a way it's part, it's almost like, like, like letting the audience pick which song you play next. You still had the song ready. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. I had all the songs lined up and I was just like, what do you guys want to hear? You want to hear, you know, uh, please, please me. Or do you want to hear magical mystery tour? <laughs> uh what do you think as far as so in the, you mentioned earlier like you gave a preview of like in the next section we'll, we'll talk about more about how we think about this stuff right mm -hmm. um what else uh i don't know if you got through your whole outline but it really feels like we're getting close to talking about the how because yeah, your, it, your outlines are are just imbued with the how <laughs> I I uh, I guess yeah yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think let's. Uh, there's probably gonna be some more how talking when we, as we talk about why. I'm sure, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm curious. It's like as far as the topic goes, I just I think it's the the interesting nugget for me is how do you and I think about taking the perspective of the person who's going to be, that we're in service to when we're doing a teaching event. Because like I said, I see too often when people are starting out, they, they get really nervous. Understandably, it's a big responsibility to step into a room full of strangers and say, I know something you don't know. <laughs> Let me help you do it, right? You know, it's like that feels very, I mean, it, it's almost like the biggest invitation to uh, imposter syndrome, right? To, 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 to ask somebody to do that. Um, but it... it I think the antidote, the, and it's it's like a very very pure, you know, like Galadriel vile antidote to this feeling is to flip that script in terms of it's not about you knowing, how, like being an expert in a topic is that's I mean, expertise is important, but so much of it, like an equal amount at least, it has to do with thinking about who you're trying to help and looking at what kinds of problems they might be encountering and how to help the, navigate them toward what they're really trying to accomplish, right? Um, and getting past those initial like hurdles and um, anxiety-inducing sort of like uh, frictions that stop us from really engaging with a new learning experience. I feel like I'm my role as a teacher is sort of sometimes just being like a, 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 a Sherpa or a guide through something, right? Uh, and help them realize that these things that are so scary and intimidating and this whole fear of failure thing isn't so scary after all. And they're to like clap them on the back and, and keep pushing them on, you know. Um, so, but how do you do that? How do you think about that person and how do you take that perspective so, so that you can package up a Skillshare workshop that says, hey, I have taken this idea of hacking a creative challenge, I've abstracted it out, 
so that if you are doing Inktober or if you're doing NaNoWriMo or if you're doing you know 30 characters in 30 days, whatever creative challenge you're doing, you can find a way to make it into your own customized uh, learning experience so you get the maximum out of it wherever you fall on the introvert extrovert spectrum right how, yeah. how do you take that how do you take that perspective right how do you do that so okay i what do you think this is uh it's a it's a great question is that what we're going to try to answer after a break yep <laughs> <laughs> Oh, talk about asking somebody to step in front of the room and invite themselves into imposter syndrome. I have the answer. All right. No, we're going to look at how we think about it. That's what we do on the Leading Tartcast. So we'll be back in about a, mi a minute and 30 seconds to uh, investigate that question. But first, we have to thank some people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be the folks... Who support us on Patreon? Patreon.com slash Lean Into Art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in me and Rob and this work that we do, you could say, hey, I would like to make it more sustainable. Here's as little as a dollar a month to help bring you to, to that sustainability level. Uh, and it could even be like a one-time contribution. You could just say like, hey, here's five bucks. And then you wait for like the month to roll around and then you can cancel your subscription. But during that month, you get access to a whole bunch of extra stuff that's in there. I want to thank five people who have been supporting Supporting us on Patreon. First up, uh, Greg Horvath. Thank you, Greg, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Greg on Twitter at IGMHORV77. Also, thank you to Becca Hilburn for believing in us and what we do. Thank you, Becca. You can find Becca everywhere online uh, at Natto Soup. And Shawnee Redfearn. Thank you, Shawnee. You can find Shawnee on Twitter at Shawnee Redfearn, F E A R N. And Merjam. Thank you, Merjam. Uh, it means a lot to us. You can find Mirjam on Twitter at M-Y-R-J-A-M-V-D-V. -V. These will all be linked in the show notes, by the way. Uh, and then finally, Shane W. Smith. Thank you, Shane. You can find Shane on Twitter at Shane underscore W underscore Smith. Your support means a lot to us. You can join them all at patreon.com slash leanatart. We will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record once a month, only for the people on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with extra leaners. Thank you once again. It means a lot to us that you believe in us and what we do. That's so awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got to hit some music so we can go to the next part, don't I? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe something like this. <laughs> and... This now means we're in the second part of the show where we talk about like how we think about why the, the why of the topic. Why do we do this the way we do it? What's informing our decisions? How do we back away and think about who we're trying to serve? So I wonder, Rob, if you can talk a little bit about like your thinking process for this uh, customizing your creative challenge. Like who, who are you thinking about? Well, I'm... I'm thinking of honestly this this is not the best advice but I'm I'm thinking of anyone who wants to partake in a creative challenge and I'm thinking of a variety of examples in that in that spectrum almost where there's there are folks who are um maybe they, they've they've played a lot they've done a lot of creative challenges and they're like I don't know why I would bother with this anymore and then there's folks who are just starting out where yeah that seems interesting but but why exactly would i do this i don't know and then there's folks that are somewhere in the middle where it's sort of a yeah i've tried it i've got feelings i haven't unpacked it i'm not sure right and so it's 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 basically to help help it be approachable to create a path through for wherever you're at that is relevant to you so it's like what makes a path relevant to you well what is engaging to you what are, what are your goals and then how do you get specific about the conditions and constraints that you want to um, uh, purposely put in your path to make the experience better to get more you know to, how do you do that right well those are design activities in a way like you can facilitate yourself through a series of um, exploration and choices in journaling and then um, create a plan that isn't that heavy handed of a plan. It's a pretty simple recipe. I've got worksheets associated with the, with the class and uh, you can work with those or just go freehand. It's all cool. But um, 
that's, let's see. It's really trying to find an easy way to, for anyone in those situations to get into this design process and then engage in it because it's essentially a design facilitation type workshop where you're purposely throwing in a spice of game design as well to try to get, get this to be to 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 get your to get you hooked on your own goal basically so the perspective i don't know like what do you what would you well i i i just i like this idea of um reframing the goal as something you're hooked on rather than something that you're paying a price for with pain right no pain no gain mm. uh you know uh exercise as punishment for eating that cookie or whatever right like uh <laughs> unless it, that's what you're into like, unless it, that's the workshop you, yes. even says like so in the in like uh, the types of games you like you may be you're just holding up a friendly little mirror that you're holding up yourself as far as maybe you're more um into very intense experiences and do you want this to also be that and if you do well pay attention to that as you choose your constraints so pick less familiar tools pick hard topics that kind of thing or back off of that if you want this to be more relaxing How much of this was in, informed? I mean, this might be a hard question to to answer, but like I, I'm curious if if any of this, maybe you don't have to quantify it, but like if any of this was informed by your experiences going through these creative challenges and thinking about what you found, uh, you know, less pleasurable and more pleasurable. So like when you're doing this perspective taking, uh, are you saying like, well, what was I experiencing when I was first doing this? Uh only toward the dynamics, not the, the specifics, right? Okay. Explain. So, it, what are some choice, some general types of choices, not specific, right? Because I'd be, be, for me to say, it'd be prescriptive for me to say, it's not a good idea to crank up all the variables in your challenge to difficult, because mm -hmm. maybe that's exactly right for you. Um, I know I've done that, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, and then you then you're facing different types of outcomes. And so again, so me, me seeing the path and having a lot of empathy for the progression of a creative challenge, the what I do to set myself up in the beginning and then how it happens to play out and the kinds of things that I encountered, like the amount of socializing and all that, the, the, the type of content that everyone's sharing really affects the amount of effort it takes to complete a creative challenge. And uh, so some of that, it's a, encountering constraints comes from my own experience, but it's mostly the, the choices and dynamics without trying to be prescriptive of like my recommendation as far as what you would, what you would want. And you be the judge, take the work, you know, whoever is, is, uh, is enticed and curious, take, take the workshop, provide, and if I welcome your feedback, if you, if you see any, you get a scent of, um, Overly prescriptiveness. Yeah. I don't think you'll find that much. Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out where that comes from, though. Like this, 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 uh, I mean, we, I think we're both very, like, aligned in that way to not want to prescribe and to create experiences that include as many different people and, and approaches as possible and celebrating that, right? Like, oh, you're the one who really wants to, you're the kid who shows up to my class with a broken thumb, but still wants to draw. Hooray for you. You're the kid who's perfectly happy just drawing Kirby over and over again. And with like cute little word balloons that you, you just change the word balloons over and over again. And you're still, you're still progressing. You're still challenging yourself in your own pace. Good for you. You know, um, like, where does that come from? Like, uh, because, like, I, I think about, like, when, when I'm designing my events, I am taking that perspective of, like, well, what was what did I find fun about this thing when I was a kid? And what did I find frustrating about this thing? Um, 
So like my, my workshops are biased to, to the extent that when I was a kid, I felt like adults did a really poor job of explaining to me why I needed to know anything. I never got a clear sense from them that why this was important. It was just like, just do it because that's what I'm telling you. And that wasn't good enough for me. It made me just punch out, you know, and I, and I remember I flunked algebra two for that reason. Um, cause like there was no, but like, al but geometry, I got a pluses in because the, the teacher really made me understand how this was important to know. Or at the very least, he like cared about the subject enough that I kind of wanted to know more about it because he, it seemed to light this guy on fire. Um, so like something that I bring to all my workshops, I'm like, I remember having a very poor experience with that. So I'm going to make sure that everybody knows why. I'm going to connect these things to other skill sets and uh, point out to them how this will, this will change your understanding of a lot of different things if you understand this deeply, right? Um, but... Uh, so there's, there is some bias there, but at the same time, it's like, I do the same thing as you where I'm like, I want to embrace the, the person who wants to really, um, take it to the next level. And then the ones who are just there to have fun. Um, it's, and that's an interesting approach when you, when you accept everyone where they're at, mm -hmm. that's a kind of workshop. That's a kind of learning experience that it really depends on, or like, are you going to be with this person one time? Uh, a recurring on uh, some kind of recurring learning ex experience or like what's this going to be like and uh and where do you want to you know who do you really want to target where if, if you want because you can even if you say this isn't a workshop for experts people with like what do you mean by experts and will pe as people right. self-elect and choose this uh, yeah. they'll have their own uh, definitions but um but you may have like a certain then bias cranked up toward a flavor of expertise or beginnerness. That's fine. It's, um, but you know, clearly what you pointed out as far as sharing a bit about your why, yeah, I, sh I have that in common as well. I mean, I prescriptive learning activities, um, are my kryptonite. I just, ugh, I, it, it's really tough if I can't find ways to start to engage with a topic based on something that's familiar, familiar enough to me and get some traction to proceed toward gaining some kind of competence. And, and, uh, but, but that only comes from having some affordances and, and openness to be included and to fail in your own way to find your way through, you know, through how do you get better at this? And, yeah, uh, teachers and classes where I've, I've, I have had the benefit of that type of style, that type of teaching style. That's, yes, that's the, I, I, I seek to put more of that in the world, not, um, not more of the, the whole prescriptive sage who, who is a, um, not, let's see, not, I'm trying to say, not resilient to any change whatsoever. Right. It's you, but you have to do all the adapting and the sage does no adapting. Those classes aren't my jam. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing in there is a desire to adapt together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I'm just, I'm trying to grab a few little nuggets of like, 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 uh, um, approach and worldview that would be of assistance to guiding somebody who wants to build their own certainly teach, as soon as you services. say that we want to adapt together how do you do that you need to be able to have a full communication loop occur and decisions and and things be affected like you described in your workshop what an awesome model of that where having the connection to then adapt and curate what could happen next mm -hmm. that's that's embodying this uh, this approach. And I think if I, I mean, I'd put a little asterisk note on there too, is that if you're doing this live, something that I see also a, uh, a lot of beginning presenters do, I mean, I get to see a lot of beginning presenters because like A2CAF, we use it as a platform to help cartoonists become teaching artists in that we invite them to lead pr presentations and workshops. And I'm especially excited about people who have never done it before because then like there's, you know, I can be there to help, you know, help them facilitate or uh, develop their workshop, or they could do like a low risk thing, like a quick draw, you know, to get started performing in front of people. But, um, but one of the things I see happen a lot with beginners is they get really concerned about 
the friction of stopping to get that input from the audience. Like, hey, what do you guys want to do next? And like, you'll see them rush through that decision making process. What do you guys want to do next? You want to do this or that? Let's go. Okay, well, guys, nothing. Okay, let's just do this, right? <laughs> and, and it's because like when you're in front of a group of twenty people, three seconds feels like an eternity. Three seconds of silence feels like a you know abysmally dreadful, awful, right? But three seconds is like not a lot of time to think of something, right? So if you say to an audience like, "What are you, what are you guys thinking about? What do you want to do next?" Uh, and giving it one, two. Three. That wasn't very long, right? But like, so like, I try to like ca uh, cajole or uh, convince, you know, teaching artists to like let those beats lie just for a second, so everybody can process and catch up to you. Um. So, but yes, like, it's it. That's a toughie to I'll, uh, say. Let's adapt together. Part of that adaptation is you being patient with the moment, and and nobody's gonna get up and walk out. They want you to succeed. <laughs> you know, they they. they that's. Yeah, very true. That what a, that's a great reminder too is that if you are if you're having a hard time with your audience and and thinking about oh I forgot what I was going to say next, it's okay to take to take a minute, shuffle your shuffle your notes, look at the thing, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you're using to help you with the facilitation, it's fine. It's yeah, people appreciate the time, and they're not going to instant. Like, there's no, um, you know, cartoon, you know. Uh, cartoon boxing glove that's going to punch you off stage or or the big old hook from vaudeville days to drag you off right exactly um, i wonder if One we could talk can, yeah go oh, good sorry well sorry man um the no. i think related to that is a lot of times starting out or even not starting out uh sometimes folks like me will put too much in their workshop and depending on how you relate with that too much, where it's like maybe they're, they are optional nodes that are planted where you're like, ah, I'm ready for a variety of topics. That's, that's what I try to do nowadays. But then if, you're, if it's sort of a, a gauntlet and you're like, oh, we don't have time to run the gauntlet, that that's, can be hard for you and the audience. Mm -hmm. And if you upfront realize that it's good to have the time and the space because it gives you more time to interact and have successful outcomes. Uh, maybe back down on the ambition as far as all the stuff that, that you need to cover in one session. What a great segue. Because uh, I wanted to go back to this thing that you were talking about in the first half about identifying and describing the dynamic, not the details. So this comes to this idea of like, how do you abstract out what you're actually trying to teach, right? So like... I've got this workshop that I've been doing with Anne since Rockets came out, uh, where we teach how to do a nonfiction mini comic. And the, the the procedure is, we introduce ourselves, we introduce the book, we talk about the shape, size, line, and color, the four you know design principles of communicating with images and comics, and we demonstrate them as we go along with them. Try you know draw a circle, draw a triangle, which one's friendly, which one's not friendly, you know, so on. Uh, and then we have the uh, the students brainstorm as many topics that they are either super knowledgeable about or super passionate about. So it could be like, I know how to make a perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or I know that Lord of the Rings is the best movie series of all time, right? Something that you're insufferable about in terms of like passion for the subject or something you're super knowledgeable about. And then after two minutes of brainstorming, we have them pick one of them, pick a topic, and you got to write down if it's, a, if it's a procedure, if it's a teaching thing, like teaching how to make a sandwich, five steps. What are the five steps to making that pe perfect peanut butter sandwich? Or if it's Lord of the Rings, five reasons. Five reasons Lord of the Rings is the best movie series of all time, right? Give them a couple minutes to do that. Then we walk them through making an eight-page mini comic template. Um, you know, the, the one sheet paper, you fold it three times and cut, and now you got a mini comic. And I go, okay. And I draw eight boxes on the board, and I go, page one is your cover. This is going to be your enticing image to get people to read your book. Page two is your introduction. Your, your narrator shows up to say, this. welcome to this book about why Lord of the Rings is the best movie of all time. Page three is step one or reason one. Page four is step two or reason two and so on until you get to page six, which should be your final reason or step. And then page seven, the last page of the mini comic or page eight rather it'd be because the cover is page one. Um, the last page is a congratulations. Now you know all you need to know about Lord of the Rings. Now you know how to make a perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, what is that workshop about, Right. If you, if you were asked me to break it into the, to the dynamic, what it's about is teaching students that they can complete a thing, that they have the knowledge that, that is required 
to complete a thing. They don't have to be an expert on something. They just have to have passion for something. And that using shape, size, line, and color is a, uh, a medium or a modality to help them communicate that thing, right? Um, you could take away the eight-page mini-comic from that. That's just the detail. You could do something completely different, right, uh, to achieve the same objective of... Journal complete. podcast. Journal podcast could be exactly the same thing. Blog article. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, like, so, like, I guess my question for you, and I don't know if this should be even be maybe even final thought, is, like, how do you abstract out to get to that core, right? Because, like, even if you're doing a, a workshop on, like, how to draw faces, let's say you're doing a workshop on how to draw a face, what are you really trying to teach there, right? Are you trying to teach, like, like structural principles of like how to actually accurately represent a face or is there something else? Is there like rendering that's involved? Is it a tool selection? Is it something about observation you're trying to teach, right? What are you really trying to get at when you pick a subject? So when I'm doing Clip Studio Paint, what am I really trying to teach? I'm trying to teach how to be organized in your thinking in about setting up in, uh, an illustration in digital software. We're going to think about how we arrange our, our, our layers. We're going to think about how we arrange... Uh, our, our stages of production and how we do tool selection. Hmm. So that's an interesting final thought. <laughs> and I, yeah, I can be, can totally get behind that because um, I mean, how do you abstract out what you're actually trying to teach? Is that your, that's your question? Yeah. Because like what you've done with the, the customizing your creative challenges is you have, done exactly that. You've said like, well, whether you're doing a mini comic or you're making a song or you're writing a book or whatever creative challenge you're trying to accomplish, this is a, stru a, a, a structured way of thinking to help help you arrive at what you most want to learn. Mm -hmm. How did you back away that far? Right? How did you not get stuck on, well, it's Inktober. So we got to do, you know, <laughs> here's, here's your, yeah, how do you I hack your Inktober? Uh, really lowered the hurdles on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, it could have been like five. I mean, Inktober is great, and I'm not. That's not about Inktober. It's just that Inktober is very specific. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And that's a that's a different target to hit than saying in general when you're thinking of a creative challenge. How how could you tune that to be more relevant to you and stuff? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to share the thoughts that helped me get there after awesome. we talk about something else. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay, cool. Yeah, I want. I want to hear how you arrived at that because that that's mm. it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, and it's something that I've only arrived at through years and years and years of teaching the same stuff. You know that like I'm like, well, what am I really after at this thing after all? You know. Uh, okay, so in about a minute and a half to two minutes, we're going to figure out how Rob ab abstracts ideas out to like get to like the fundamental uh, objective of what we're trying to do when we. Uh, unpack our experiences to teach. But before we do that, we got to thank some other people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be us. We make this show possible. We make stuff. We think about the stuff that we make. We journal it. We uh, process it. And then we come back to this show to share those experiences in the forms of these weekly topics. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. Uh, there is a book out now, 92-page uh, graphic novella, comic book, whatever you want to call it. It's comics. And it's called Mining for Trouble. And it's the story of this bird and this bear who are adventurers together, uh, trying to find work, helping people. Uh, a, lot, a, lot of, um, a lot of freelance jokes in this book. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of parallels to what we do as uh, independent contractors. And they come, they come afoul of these mineral girls who have taken over a mine because mineral people uh, live off of, uh, they, they consume precious metals to survive. And they've got it in their heads that uh, if they just push people around to get what they want, then they'll get more of what they want. Whereas maybe in encountering this gentle bird and this, am or this ambitious bird and gentle bear, they'll learn that there's uh, other ways to get what you want in life. You can find it at books.jdrozd.com. Indieplanet.com is the place to get it right now. And you can get it in print for, I think, like 16 bucks. And I, for much, much less, I think it's like a dollar or something, you can get a digital download. Uh, Rob, you said at the top of this episode that you do coaching. What does that mean? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, coaching is about uh, just thoughtfully navigating some decisions. And you might think, oh, a coach, I hire a coach. Coaches tell me what to do. How do you know, where's the goal and how do I get there and whatever. It's all about 
you and your your goals, your thinking, and me as a coach, it's more of the the, the professional life coach style coaching to um, uh, be a, be a supportive navigator of questions. And that helps you come up with your own answers to, to navigate anything from uh, where you're stuck on a creative project or where you're going next in your career, weighing out different uh, options and opportunities in front of you. We all do this. We get in our own way. We think of extra things and, and, and spin up or spin off to different, different directions when there are ways to navigate and come up with what we want to do next, take that next smallest step toward where we want to go. And uh, having a coach is just a, it's a, it's a very helpful service to, you know, you know, that you can, you can hire me to help you navigate that stuff. I happen to be uh, extra focused on, on like creative process and software, creative collaboration, design career type situations, right? Uh, product teams and whatnot. My wife, Kate, Kate Shield Stenzinger, she's also a coach and she's especially focused on uh, couples who are creative and entrepreneurial, right? Anyway, so for me, you can uh, just sign up for a discovery session to see if I'm the right kind of coach for you or, or learn more about what coaching is about. You can go to robcoach.me and sign up there. For Kate, easy way to find her coaching is mycoachkate.com. So again, I am robcoach.me. She's mycoachkate.com. You can find both of them at shieldsstenzinger.com. This will all be linked in the show notes. Uh, If you are here because you like the way we think about stuff more than the stuff we make, fair enough. The show is the thing we make. There's more things like it at leanintoart.com slash workshops where you can download self-contained videos at a price of your choosing, even free. If you're listening to the show on a podcatcher like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, giving us a five-star review wherever you listen to us helps more people find the show. And if you're watching the video on YouTube, giving it a thumbs up helps more people find the show. And if you are if you watch the show live on Twitch, just share the link, twitch.tv slash leanintoart. That helps more people find it as well. And we thank everybody who has been doing those things. It means a lot to us. Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right. I did this before, you know, excited, anticipation. What well, do we got? How do you abstract this stuff out, Rob? Oh, gosh, I was going to ask you. So you went first. <laughs> all right. So, all right, fine. I'll go first. <laughs> so a- abstracting it out, it's... It's not necessarily a process of trying to look at this thing as a general thing. You don't have to do that. You can just look in and do and do do some reflection about why are you doing this and getting um, getting intentional about it. And that may take time. Like you, you may not sit down and in one session ask yourself, "Why am I teaching this thing?" or "Why do I want to?" or "What if I describe why someone would do this? What would I even say in there?" Like. I just have this initial urge. And if, if it's not fully examined yet, or even if you can fully examine, because obviously you can just, well, in my experience, you can ask questions infinitely, but um, asking why, it's a great place to, to, to focus and peel back. So here, I'll, I'll read this rough text that I wrote initially when I was coming up with the draft of choosing, uh, and I called it choosing a custom creative challenge when I first you know, did it, but now it's called customizing your next creative challenge. Why am I, and why are, why am I making this? Creative challenges are an ongoing temptation for me to feel a win, to get further, to grow, to overcome an optional barrier, which teaches me I can overcome other barriers. Creative challenges are such a flexible, amazing tool that I've learned from. I want to share and encourage others to find their own way and make use of them. Creative challenges are like I found a great kind of pen and paper, which is so fun to use. I want other people to know about it. Is that sentence great? Not really, but I still got it on my head. Um, said the narrator. Uh, I pr- I've participated in and created creative challenges. I've journaled, reflected, discussed, explored them over so many years, so much I feel I have useful things to say about them. I made a workshop to help with, and I said this in the past tense before I did it, by the way, said the narrator. I made a workshop to help with making your next creative challenge fun. Why do we do this to ourselves versus this is so awesome. Why doesn't everyone enjoy creative challenges? So what I heard in there is your part of your abstraction is reframing the motivation for doing it Mm -hmm. rather than making it a compulsory thing. Well, everybody's doing this. So I guess I got to do that now. 
into, oh man, I can't wait to do this thing, right? Uh, sure. And I'm not thinking about all those other people necessarily, right? Like I can do this without thinking about anybody else or I can do it with thinking about them, but that's my choice. I'm the one who chooses whether or not that happens. It's not something imposed upon me. It's something I'm choosing to engage with. You, in a way, yes, you're you're defining the common ground because hope like that your audience is going to share that why. Or they're they're not your really your your audience, probably, right? Mm-hmm. There's um there's going to be a common ground with folks that, who take this workshop where they're like, Yeah, I know these are useful and I want to find ways to make it more useful for me so I can keep taking take uh taking advantage of this format for my own personal and professional growth. It's like, all right, I got the workshop for you. Um and and yeah. I have not done this with all my workshops, right? This is a this is a this practice I've I've started, you know, I, I have some of the the beliefs that inform how I go about making a workshop. And I have passion for various topics. And overall, I like just honoring and celebrating the participation with those different things. And that mm-hmm. can be enough also. It's gotten me through ma- making many different workshops. But yeah. I think getting this why is helpful because it's a way to to check in with oh yeah this 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 procedure here am i am i heading in the right direction um and also i got to describe this and market this thing what am i if i just talk about yeah it's 27 minutes Woo! you know that's not going to sell anybody anyway so but you get that why now you've got this kernel of of um clarity that you can use to spread yep. the idea. I, I, there was a workshop, and I'm not using this as an example because they didn't have a why, because I actually didn't get to sit in on the, on the workshop, but it, um, it was uh, Bruce Warden's How to Draw Hands at CXC, which is like, that's a pretty, that's a very compelling sell regardless, because we all agree hands are difficult to draw and they're important to draw if you want to have mastery in illustration and comics. You're going to have to draw hands at some point, right? But then... If if I were to teach that workshop, I would step back and say, okay, why is it important to draw hands, right? We all know it's hard. We all have an an intrinsic feeling that it's important to do it, but why? What 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 what, what do we get out of it? Well, how how would I tell ten year old Jersey who really needs to know why why it's important to draw hands well? Because ten year old Jersey would be like, well, I can just put boxing gloves on the guy. I can put his hands behind his back. I can have him always be leaning on something where there's a book in the way. I can cover that up pretty well. You know, I don't have to draw hands. Right. Uh, and if I go, well, but if you want mastery, my son, he didn't care about mastery. He just cared about telling stories. Okay. What does he want to do? Right. He wants to tell stories that make people feel really interested in the characters. Ah, well, hands are an important expressive vehicle that tell you the difference between somebody who is very authoritarian and somebody who is very open and and reasonable, right? Uh, I'm gesturing with my hands for those who are listening to the podcast uh, as an audio, but right, like you can you can it doesn't take a whole lot of digging and brainstorming to get at uh, like some really decent whys for anything you're trying to package up and teach for somebody. Rob, you did you had a great uh, closing thought for this one. Well, I don't know. I I got pressured into it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Let me, let me, let me, I, just, I love let me, this topic. It's fun, man. Like, nah. Let me spar you into uh, a corner and make you, you know, like while I'm pummeling you from the side, you're like trying to reason with me as to like what the, 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 the final thought is. <laughs> uh, it's no, you, you, I, okay. You, um, it, it, I don't know. We all, ha- we have our different ways of getting there. And I, uh, no, I, I really appreciate us uh, g- going through this because I'm, I'm going to use this, this reflection as I, you know, go about my next workshop. Hopefully, hopefully it's useful for and encouraging for others out there where it's like, Oh, does this seem mysterious? And even if it seems highfalutin or you hear some example of someone else's workshop, um, there's a way to get, you know, to, to get into approachable and, uh, I, I, it's exciting to see others share what they make and and learn why. So hopefully yeah. it's a, a little bit of a, we don't have a specific call to action as far as, you know, oh yeah, it's workshop day, whatever. No, <laughs> but yeah, it's every not, day is workshop day. Every day, every day is workshop day. 
some someday we'll do a creative challenge in which we generate workshops. But until then, yeah, yeah, I know. I had to take a breath when I said that too. Um, <laughs> but for now, I think we've made a podcast. Uh, so thank you, Rob, for this this uh, discussion. And uh, we record almost every week, unless we need to take a break for doing things like Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, but we usually record live on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time, 11 Central. We stream live on twitch.tv slash Lena Tort, and we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash Lena Tort and Lena Tort.com. Until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of Lena Tort.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Rob Stenzinger of Lean Into Art.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger on Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user Lean Into Art. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.